Hey Internet, so I'm going to try something here today, which may or may not be something that happens often, but what I'm going to be doing is recording my podcast, which has had too many names already, so I'm just going to call it the podcast for the moment, and I'm going to return to a series that I did on the podcast called, Is the Church Dying? And I'm going to record it live here right now with you watching, and if you're listening on the podcast, I did this a couple days before I released the podcast and recorded it live. It will not be available as a video immediately after. It's going to go private and it'll come back after the podcast is released. So if you want to check it out again later, you will need to get the podcast, which should come out on Thursday. And it's a little bit of an experiment to do these things at the same time. I don't think it would be the regular thing I would do, but I thought, huh, why not? And so what I want to do again is, is return to this idea of the church, and whether or not the church is dying. For, for a video, by the way, I probably will not do as much camera work today, right? You're just kind of, you're watching me while I do this, so I'll probably be looking down more. We're going to talk about is the church dying because, as most of you probably know, although podcast listeners may not yet, that there was a pretty big event for the Missouri Synod in Rockford this past weekend as The mother congregation, which is the one I serve, chose to leave behind our legacy building and move to a, what was a failed mission plant that they had reabsorbed many years before, a little more outside of town. It's, well, the original building's not in a great neighborhood. The new building's not really in a neighborhood (laughs) at all. Uh, So it's it's not exactly better in that regard. But uh, this was all done after a great deal of study and care and thought for the sake of good stewardship, ultimately, because it would enable us to continue to be a congregation, which we otherwise might not be in a couple of years. It's a pretty profound thing for a congregation to do, for a group of humans to do, to choose what is necessary and what will last over things that are good, which don't always last, and sometimes, in fact, perish with their use. Now, there's another video I've already done about this, at youtube.com slash riffiskj, you can see I talked that night about the experience, and you can go check that out if you like. But coming out of that now, I want to return to this question that I started asking two years ago, not because I'm asking it, but because others have asked it or even proclaimed it. And I do not believe the Bible allows the answer to be the word yes. But to get that and to understand that, means to some extent you have to fight against your experience and what you see at various times and places. And you can't do that without the the theology, the knowledge of God that is given in the scriptures to convince and give you that confidence to stand against what the world says, or it's more, more often than what the world says, although that comes up too, it's what it looks like. It's what it looks like. It looks like it's true that the church is dying. And that would be very evident in this past weekend as we closed for Word and Sacrament Ministry this not ancient but not new space. And there were a couple of comments that I heard from the morning from those who were the most aggrieved by the situation. And they kind of they speak to this because it really is a matter of what do you, what do you believe? And this is, this is why it's important. Like I, I really don't have any personal grudges, uh, even though there's been some slander, not a lot, some. Uh, I don't like to hold grudges either way. It's just not worth it. Life's too short. And so I don't bring this up to like call anybody out. I'm not going to mention names. But what is said demonstrates a, a certain belief and or lack of belief in at least a particular element of the knowledge of God given to us in Jesus. And for us as Christians to survive, we we can't tolerate in our own hearts such things. And so I'm sharing it. I actually don't believe the the people in question will, will ever see it or hear it here. Maybe they will. But I'm sharing it for them and for you, right? For us, so that we would be able to counter the half truth or the lie with what is actually true, with what God has actually said. So, 
the, the two things were, and, and then we're going to get into, we're going to go a little deeper here, right? So this is just kind of intro by way of intro. The two things that were said were this. One thing that was said was that this is the last service at St. Paul. And I believe someone responded, well, no, no, we're having church next week at our other site that has a sign that says St. Paul and constitution that says St. Paul and all that kind of stuff. And the response was, this is the last service at St. Paul. So the issue there is, what is St. Paul Lutheran Church? Or put your own church name in there, right? What is it? What does the word church mean? And the definition that was being used at that moment by this individual is that the church is the building. Like unequivocally, no two bones about it, the church is the building, and this is the last time we'll be at the building, which it, it is true in that regard. The challenge is, both legally and biblically, is is that the best use of the word church? Right. This is the last service at this sanctuary. Absolutely true. No. But but the last service at St. Paul. Well, who is St. Paul Lutheran Church? And again, put your own church name in here. Don't don't use mine. Just I, just, I have to use mine because it, this is mine. Yeah. But. What is, how do you define what your church is? Now, so far as the government is concerned, the, the legal reality of these churches that scatter the landscape of America, the church is not the building at all. The building is property that's not taxable because it's owned by the church. But the church is not the building and the building is not the church. They are two very different things. And where that is established aside from kind of common reason, where that is established is in what you would call your church constitution. Most congregations will have two different documents that they operate with. One's called the constitution, one's called the bylaws. And some people think these are the same thing because we'll talk about, say, the constitution and bylaws. But they're not the same thing. They're they're related to each other, but they're, they're very different. So the constitution of a congregation is what constitutes it. It, it is a, a statement about what is the church. It is like literally that. And they are usually a little brief. They can get long, but it's not a good idea to have them be long. They are intended to be brief, and they're usually very difficult to change because they are intended to last. And then you have the bylaws, which are a an outflowing of the constitution, usually related to it directly. Like, so if constitution has an article three, there probably is a bylaw that gets connected to that in some way, but the bylaws don't constitute the congregation. The bylaws set rules for how this constituted congregation is going to operate, right? So it's like your operating principles, your tactics. If you, you can define strategy and tactics a little bit there. So in any case, in your constitution, which is where we want to focus here, you tell the government when you start being this not taxable group of people, an entity, right? In America, you tell the government, this is who we are. This is what we are. And the government acknowledges you are a non-taxable entity because you are a church. And so we can't tax your church building because you are a church congregation. Yeah. So according to the government, it's pretty clear that the church is not the building. The church is the the people, but it's not really quite that. It kind of is, but it's more like the books. The church is the the finances, and that's kind of as far as the government can go because that's how the government thinks. Yeah, the the church is the bank accounts, and they treat that bank account like a person for tax purposes, but as a person who is not to be taxed. So you got that right. That's one way of, of looking at it. Now, in a Missouri Synod congregation, you will have in the Constitution not merely a, a statement about how we need a board of council or chairs or directors or things like that. It'll That'll be there too. But early on, you'll have a very clear statement about what the church really is and that this group of people gathered together is there to receive the word and the sacraments of Jesus Christ and that everything that's done in this congregation is to be first put under that. And that gets us then to, you know, in answering what is the church, the question, what does the scripture say about this, right? 
And now we're going to we're gonna try to dig deep on some of this, and we may come back to this as a series, we may not, but I'm just going to say it rather than prove it right away, I'm just going to throw it out there, that it is, there's no question, it, it, you cannot argue against this in any way without being beyond unreasonable, biblically speaking, that the church is Christians gathered around the scriptures. There's just, there's no way to debate that. It is the only thing the church is. It is the only thing the church will ever be. The only reason we call these buildings churches is because they are where churches gather, uh, where the church congregates. And really, sanctuary is a better word, honestly, because the word church is confusing. When you put it on the sign, it's like, yeah, this is St. Paul Lutheran Church on Sunday when the people are there. But the rest of the week, it's, it's, a, it's a sanctuary and an office for the use of the people who serve and belong to St. Paul Lutheran Church. Yeah. But see, this has gotten all muddled. And some of this is an English issue. Although you go back in the Lutheran theology in the German, and there's some confusion there too between different words for congregation and district and things like that. So, so you got that as well. But again now, so today's the last service at St. Paul Lutheran Church. Only, only if you don't believe that the people that the government thinks are St. Paul Lutheran Church are people who Jesus thinks are St. Paul Lutheran Church. And that you're effectively saying, whether you understand it or not, that this group of people aren't, aren't Christians then, because Jesus doesn't think that they're the church that has previously met in this building. And that now by moving, they're ceasing to be St. Paul Lutheran Church. Now, I don't think the individual meant that, that way, but that's the way the theology works. And a lot of times you say something and maybe you don't quite know what its ramifications are going to be when you put all the pieces together. So I get it. It was the last day at that sanctuary and that was sad. So cool. I'm with you. But then the language that's being used is language which is harming people who hear, who are like thinking that this is this is beyond understandable, for indeed we will not cease to worship here. And, or well, to worship together, I should say. And so the other comment that came up, which I thought was really interesting, was when somebody who is not a member, but had been a member, and was there to visit, which is great. I actually had a lot of those people there. Many of them were quite happy with the situation, not, not the situation, but the way it was handled. This member approached somebody and, and asked uh, who they knew was a member. And they said, so where are you going to start going to church now next week? And again, it was like, but we're not stopping. What are you talking about? We're, we're still the church. We're still St. Paul, right? And, and again, so it, whether that person understood the question they asked or whether they'd heard other people say it's the last service at St. Paul Lutheran Church, see the confusion that's created by the words? So this is all, again, by way of introduction to trying to dig a little deeper onto the idea of what is the church, what defines the church, biblically speaking, so that when people make claims about what the church can or cannot be, what the church will or will not do in the present age, whether it's this congregation that I'm at or, or any other, so that you are girded up to counter that with what is ultimately the gospel, because the church is part of the gospel. Or as I talk about in my book, Echo, it is a, res a direct result of the gospel. So if you, want to, if you want to call it the gospel, you want to call it a result of the gospel, they're, they're kind of the same thing. You got second article, third article of the creed, and so they, they, there is a distinction that we can make there. But it is good news to be the church and to know what Jesus says about the church. It is tremendous good news, hope and confidence and all sorts of stuff. And when someone says something like, which has not been said here yet, yet, uh, that the church is dying or that the church must change or it will die, they also then are, whether they understand it or not, making theological statements that go directly against the knowledge of God we have in the scriptures and what he has said about the church. If the church is the body of Jesus, whom Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against, 
who indeed then died and rose on those days 2,000 years ago, well, then how could she die now? If Christ is risen from the dead never to die again, how on earth could his body, the church, not also? And see, this is kind of the thing, too. It really betrays how much we, we, Protestants, handle that language of the body of Christ in the Bible. And Paul says at several places that we are the body of Christ, that we really take that as purely figurative. It's just a symbol. It's not really, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just like a nice way of talking about groups of people. It's a body of people. Yeah. But the language that Paul uses, both there directly and then in, in context and other places, makes it pretty clear that it's not, it's not symbolic. We are not symbolically the body of Jesus. And so Protestants, Protestants will kind of get this one like, I'm going to be his hands. I'm going to be his feet, right? Like, I'm Jesus in people's skin, like this kind of stuff, which is, yeah, that's got all sorts of silly, weird issue with it. But at least you're like recognizing that you're, you're part of the body, the actual body of the raised, ascended, divine man, Lord Jesus, physically. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that's good that you would see that. But let's like backtrack it here again to, because that is that real, it is that true, it is that physical a reality, then that means that his body, the church, those who believe as a body group, will never, can never perish. The church can never die. And even though individuals die, yet they live, right? And we know the baptismal promises of, of Romans 6 is that even though you die and yet live, you also be raised again because you are the body of Christ. You're put into the body of Christ in baptism. So the death can't contain you any more than it contained him. Because you're not a different body. You're his body. You individually and then you plural. Huh? I mean, it, it, we're just scratching the surface here of this thing. Uh, let, me, let me give you a big word while we're doing that or pausing for a second. This, this thing is called ecclesiology which is the word Jesus uses for the church. We use a word that's got a, a German root. That's just the way the translation cookie crumbled. But Jesus uses the word ecclesia, and he describes it, he defines it, he insists that it will exist. He makes promises about it. So this is where a Christian who says, I, you know, I can be a Christian with just the Bible, I don't need the church, the answer to that directly is, you don't read your Bible very well, do you? Because you're ignoring everything Jesus says about the church. The word is there, and then it's there more because he doesn't always, he, not all the apostles always use the word ecclesia. Sometimes they use things like, you are the body of Christ, right? So you have even more there. It's, it's tremendously deep as a topic, and, and maybe one of the most important for our era because it's kind of where the heresies have hid, along with the heresies of the last hundred years, 200 years have largely focused on the Holy Spirit, which I think is interesting, and this may just be speculation here, but it seems that the early church heresies were all about the Trinity. And then it, it moved from the Trinity into the person of Jesus, into the Holy Spirit, in terms of their divinity. And then you had a time where the heresies really focused on justification, which would have been at the heart of Article 2, right? The, the Son of God's work for us and what it means. And so that's the difference between Rome and, and Protestantism, kind of, right? Loosely speaking. Definitely the difference between Rome and Lutheranism, the Lutheran confession. And then then you have the spirit, right? And it's like the last 200 years we've been in the, the spirit heresy. Now, it's always been there, all these versions, and there's nothing really new. But the emphasis now in our present time on the heresy of churches, meaning teaching about the church heretical things, that's being done a lot more avidly, or teaching about the Holy Spirit, heretical things, that's doing being done a lot more avidly or a lot more popularly than it may have been done in the past. It was just kind of in the background, but now it's kind of the thing, right? So again, the, the church must change or die. That that right there is it. Yeah? That concept or that idea is is a heresy. It's a heresy. And it, and it rejects, again, a very deep thing called ecclesiology, or that's a word for describing the study of this ecclesia, right? The knowledge of this Church. Now, we translate it as church, but the word ecclesia means to call out or to congregate or to, to, to gather. So, of course, this is why you have groups like 
the assemblies of God that when they're going to go back to just the Bible and they're going to fix everything with more Holy Spirit heresies, they um, they call themselves not the Church of God. They call themselves the Assembly of God because that's like the real word. Yeah, and and they're not wrong. It is a better word, assembly, than than church because church just sounds like a building, right? At the same time, it's not a magic word. What we need is the understanding of what that word means. What does it mean to be the assembly which God has called? And of course, for the assemblies of God, they define that as those who speak in tongues, more or less. Again, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush very fast, but kind of officially, with everything else that they add, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you're not really taking it to the next step, and so you're either backsliding or or not a Christian at all. And so, you know, that that's kind of their definition of assembly, what the word ecclesia would mean, what it means to be called out or called together in the New Testament. Now, I would disagree with that, right? As I've already stated earlier in this, that that uh, the definition I would use is the ones who gather around the Word of God, that is to hear the Word of God, or to hear it preached, even more specifically. And of course, Lutherans don't always just talk about word ministry, we talk about word and sacrament ministry, because when you study the Word of God, you find out there's just a couple things that add physical elements to the Word. One's called baptism, and it adds water to the word, and one's called the Lord's Supper, and it adds bread and wine to the word, and those are pretty mysterious how they work. They're, they're confusing, miraculous even, so we call them sacraments, mysteries. So we gather around the word, and when we do that, we ultimately must end up baptizing and eating bread and wine. Now, I'm not going to chase the kind of inner Lutheran argument about the third sacrament of the Office of the Keys. We'll leave that for another time, and w- yeah, go read your confessions. It has the answers really clear. If you know about it, then why are you even arguing about it? You know what the confessions say to even know about this argument. So let it be. Uh, with that said, though, what we want to do is start to dive deep into this, what is the church? What is the ecclesiology? In order to have the confidence of the promises which are given to the church. Yeah? So before with this series, I've been kind of working out of David Wells' Courage to be Protestant, which is a really good read. Although as I started using it as the foil for the podcast, I, I got stale for me really quick because it's kind of a scattershot thing. It was like, and it was all good, but it was just a little too difficult to kind of go straight through. So I'm going to riff on a little bit here, a book called uh, The Church and Her Fellowship, Ministry, and Governance by Kurt Marquardt. It's in the Confessional Lutheran Dogmatics series, which is, I think it is now published by CPH. It didn't used to be published by CPH. Oh, uh, look, look, look at it here. Can't quite tell. Can't t- tell that fast, but it doesn't matter. This is a pretty astounding little book. And uh, uh, all the stuff I had to read at seminary, pro- I'd, I put it in the top five, probably. It, it is, and, and you know, discounting the confessions, right? Uh, so we're, we're going to mess with this a little bit here, and we'll see what it does for us. I haven't gone back and reread it. We're going to be working at hi- highlights here. And oh, just just for fun just for fun, uh, that will allow me to test this little thing out. Now, those of you who are listening, you're not really able to see this, but those of you who are watching, isn't that cool? That's my cell phone doing that. That's pretty cool. So this first idea here that our world is not post-Christian, merely post-Constantinian, which is a very different matter, uh, that is a a really huge concept. And, and so certainly in the older episodes in this series— I reference that because Wells talks about that as well. David Wells talks about that as well. But it's worth remembering here, so I'll try to do it really briefly for you, that to confuse Christianity's existence with, instead of Constantinianism, why don't we call it Christendom, right? They're kind of the same thing. Maybe not technically, but but yeah, kind of they are. So the confusion of these two things is much of what is lead what leads us to the despair or the fear of the present decline that we see. Because what we definitely see declining is Chris and Dumb. We see the church's respect in the Western world, its place of honor, its ability to practice freely. We see those things being challenged. We see people not coming to church just because their parents did. Uh, that that's that's going away. And to think that it was always there is where the error begins. Excuse me. It was not always there. It was there only after this guy named Constantine. Now, Constantine is an emperor in the Roman Empire 
before it became the Holy Roman Empire. He's kind of the one who makes that eventually happen. Not, not directly, but he sets, he sets that in process. And he converts to Christianity, long story short, and he legalizes Christianity. He does not make it the official religion. He only makes it legal, so it's now legal to be a Christian. Well, there were 300 some odd years of Christianity before this guy. And during that entire time, they're, they're underground. Now, it's not like at every moment in that they're being hunted and having to run around and hide, right? It's not, it's not quite like that either. And it's not like they were all just in these like little small group house churches singing songs. They were the church then. And they, they did meet in houses, often houses that were converted into sanctuaries, worship space capable of gathering enough people to have a meal together, right, and to hear the word preached. But Constantine comes along, and he makes this legal, which kind of sets in place, also it's becoming official. Now, he doesn't do that himself, but it, it isn't far behind. And from that point on, Christianity held a very privileged spot in Western civilization, and I don't think this is bad. I don't think it was all done by the sword either. I think that Christianity as an intellectual tradition convinced a lot of pagans who are trapped in weirdo mystery cults where they're sacrificing babies and having sex with everybody, but also despairing and you know eating so much that they puke and eat more and all sorts of crazy stuff. Christianity seemed and actually is a better way. And so you do have real conversion taking place, and Christianity gets gets pride of teaching spot to be the intellectual tradition of, well, the next 1,700, right? 1,700 years, not quite that much. That's Constantinianism, right? That, that Constantine shifted the axis, and Christendom arose, not by the sword, but by intellectual debate, right? Winning over hearts and minds. Behind this, are there swords? Yeah, there's swords everywhere, all the time. I and mean, Everyone's using swords for one thing or the other. And so there are Christians who use swords, there are Muslims who use swords, there are Buddhists who use swords. There, it is, the, the swords are there, the governments are fighting, they're rising and falling, nations come and go. But Christendom was this even bigger idea that whichever nation comes or goes, it should be supporting and holding up Jesus and his church. And that's the thing that has begun to wane and die is that support. And yet what we tend to do is we confuse that waning and dying of the support with the waning and dying of the actual church. Yeah, And, and part of this is because we see less people attending the buildings than we used to back when it was kind of the main game in town. But we're also assuming, looking back, that back when it was the main game in town, that everything that went on in every one of these churches across the country was actually church. And that's maybe overly generous, let's just say, uh, significantly overly generous. I mean, all you have to do is watch any any church service uh, on a movie from even, even 30, 40 years ago, and you'll just see how little is portrayed of real Christianity uh, in, in those uh, the things that are said. So, and kind of leave that aside for a second here, but we see the decline of the numbers of people attending these buildings, and we equate that with the decline of the church or the number of Christians. Now, I'm not going to argue, because I don't know, and you can't judge hearts, right? You know, If people would mark, I'm a Christian, on their census, which is where a lot of our numbers come from, you know, who knows what they really think or what they really believe. There's another book behind me back there called The Churching of America uh, by Fink, I believe is his name. And uh, that, one's, that one's really interesting too, because it, it deals with the fact that even the number of people who will say I'm Christian on these census things, it's not really that much down from say where it was in the turn of the 1900s. It was like really down. Like it wasn't nearly as strong as, as we think it was, but that's, that's a whole different story. What we're seeing is again, you know, financial support capacity of congregations waning and attendance numbers waning. And we think, oh, the church is dying. Okay. So, so first we really have to address that the real reason that most of the things we call churches have waning numbers has everything to do with not having children. And it's not everyone not having children. It's particular ethnic groups not having children. And when certain often educated ethnic groups, decide not to have children. Over the course of 30 or 50 or 60 years, their social clubs cease to be able to support themselves. 
Now, when you mix into this the transitory nature of American civilization, right? So you, you had two kids, not five, and then they both moved away and now live in different cities, right? You add that in, and now the social clubs really get the, the, the screws put to them, yeah? Especially the ones in the country, but also the ones in the city, and even the ones in the suburbs, depending. So the decline of the population base as it exists is definitely impacting the decline of these organizations that we equate with the church, again, our buildings, or say our schools. Yeah? It's hard to have a school when you don't have any kids. And well, there's neighborhood kids. Yeah, but they're not your kids. They're not your culture. They have a different way of looking at things. Maybe the parents don't even really care about this school, yeah? uh, this kind of school. You know, you're assuming that they do. So that explains a lot of what we see. And while the uh, the birth rate in the United States continues to be just barely above replacement values. If you break that down into ethnic groups, it is all immigration. Not all the immigrants have kids, and even even their ethnic groups within a couple generations tend to jump on the no kids bandwagon. Which, okay, whatever you can argue that in terms of you know social climate or politics or whatever. But if you are a congregation, it does mean that. You will be not. It will be unlikely for you to maintain what you were maintaining before, in terms of people power and numbers. You know, eight kids who grew up to be people with jobs in the same city is going to be able to do more for their family church than two kids who move away, right? And if we're all those that move away, you've got to have either somebody move in or you've got to convert somebody. And of course, some get mad about this demographic talk because they want to say, "Well, mission should do it all." I'm not against mission, and I'm not against mission doing something. I think it should. I think it's ignorant of science and reality to think that only mission will do it all because it never has, ever. And they're like, but Pentecost, there were 3,000. They were already Jews, people. They were already circumcised. They already were inside. Yeah, They already were part of the deal, culturally speaking. And what we're dealing with, we talk about real mission in the United States— is you do have to breach cultures. And you think, oh, we should. None of us are racist. I think we should not be racist, and there are some. But just because you think racism is wrong, which it is, doesn't mean that those differences don't matter. It's, I mean, just use language as the example, right? If, if I walk into a congregation of people that speak Swahili, and I never learn Swahili, I'm not going to get very far. Huh? Is it possible for the Spirit to pour out a, a latter-day gift of the translation of tongues? Well, uh, in theory, yes, although I think biblically, no, no, but we'll leave it there. In theory, sure, but but that ha doesn't happen much. So we got to translate it into Swahili, uh, duh, right? Well, this is the case with anything that is, and I'm, I, don't, I don't know what the root word here would be, you know, anything we would be xenophobic of or they would be xenophobic of us. Whenever you have differences that are significant cultural differences, it creates a challenge for communication. So to think that a bunch of Anglo-Germanic and or like Germanic people who really like a building are just going to have a bunch of people that are not like them in any way walk in and want to help them save their building is really kind of foolish. And then to equate that with whether or not the church is living or dying is, is uh, downright ignorant, right? And even blasphemous in a sense, although I don't mean like you're out of the faith. I just mean like you don't see where what you've said is going to go if you put all the pieces together with what the Bible says, right? So as a result of this, I don't know if you can hear my kids running up and down the hall. Uh, as a result of this, the work of mission is not one we can rely on in order to establish congregations in such a way that the ones that are there can ignore the demographic issue. That's what that comes down to. You can't ignore it. And then, if you are going to try to break out of barriers and get into other cultures, then you you have to come stripping away your culture. At least to start. Now, I'm not talking about worship. Don't hear me saying that. I'm not talking about how we need some praise bands. That, that's, that's the same problem. You're insisting on your culture. <laughs> rather than on the necessary things. 
what you have to do first for yourself is within your own life of faith individually and then as a congregation, focus on those things that are needful as the center of your life. And if they're not, if they, if the word and the sacraments of Jesus are not what you gather around every week, and it's not what you speak about as a people, if you are unequipped to speak the words when you leave, if you never say another word about it the rest of your week, then no one's going to join your congregation because you don't even really belong to it because you don't believe it's there. Does, does that make sense? I mean, think how little... Someone would come watch your sports team if you never wanted to go watch it yourself. And yet that's how a lot of Christians who are in these churches, which are in part social clubs, kind of treat it, right? It, it really is. Well, I don't really want to go to church. I don't really want to go. Uh, too much time. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, then who's going to join? <laughs> no one's going to join. So the task of mission becomes very challenging because you you have to first not evangelize out. First, you have to make sure you all agree. That this thing is everlasting. yeah. And to get that, you got to get down to what is necessary, what is needful, what is commanded, what is true. And you have to believe it enough that you want to share it with somebody. And then from there, from there, you can go and start figuring out, how do I take this thing that is completely true and give it to somebody else in the midst of their cultural setting? Not by planting a worship service there, right? But by having conversations about eternal things with starting points that that they can grasp or, or hold on to. And this is where then I think one of the, the real tricks and why Lutheran mission has been hmm, lacking in, in America in, in the last you know, 30 years. And I'm not saying I have an answer. I just think I can diagnose the problem. Is because we have so much code language that we use within our congregations, uh, both as pastors and as people, that when we go and we try to talk to other people about it, we have to use the code language. We don't know of a way to say it otherwise. And then we end up sounding like like a car mechanic talking to someone who doesn't know cars about, you know, the flux capacitor or whatever, right? Or we, we end up sounding like, uh, you know, a, a dentist talking about the, the third incisive molar or whatever, right? And you're, and you're just like, you know, you, you string enough of that together as you're talking to this person who's actually a little nervous about you anyway because of your own cultural heritage. And and why would they listen? Why are they, how are they going to get it? So that's hard work. That's not easy to, to figure out what that necessary thing is and then to be able to learn it well enough that you don't have to rely on the code language but can strictly confess it and teach it. Okay, again, so... The code language was there 30 years ago because of the Christendom Constantinianism thing. But that code language is part of what has fallen away. So again, we, we equate the church dying with this, and we shouldn't, but the language of the church has certainly been removed from the language of the people in our, in our country. And so to talk to the country, to talk to the world, we, we have to be able to, again, translate our language. Now... That's all coming out of kind of a tangent from this distinction between the post-Constantinianism Christendom thing and, and before. And the, the, the purpose of all of this is to emphasize that what we see falling apart is not God's church. Because God's church cannot and does not fall apart ever. Because Jesus does not fall apart ever. What we see is instead a civilization built upon premises that are part of Christianity or given by Christianity to the world. We're seeing that civilization reject those premises and so also reject its support of the church which gave them those premises. But that's not the church dying, that's the civilization dying. Now, civilizations can die and rise, and it can be a good or a bad thing either way. So I'm not going to just assume here this is bad, although I kind of think it is. Uh, but that's not really the point, right? The point is to not assume that this also means that the congregation, the actual congregating of people of Jesus, is dying everywhere or even locally. Yeah. Now, it is also – and we talked about the demographics, so there's, there's less people that are easily found, right? And you have to do a harder work to find the ones that don't fit with your culture. 
And there's like, when I say culture, I don't mean white and black. There are, there are so many different cultures in this country. So many different like habitual little groups and ways of doing things. I mean, it's just, it's manifold. And so if they're not already with you, you got to assume they're kind of different than you. And then breaking through that is, is easier said than done. So you got that whole thing going on. Oh, I lost my thought. Oh, I lost my thought. This is the problem with life. Oh, I did pretty well there without ever, normally in a podcast, I'd stop now, right? I'd fix this. I was talking about, okay, post-Constantinism, the church is no longer supported by the civilization and us confusing that with the church dying, but the church can't die. The numbers are actually going down. That is true because of demographics. Yes, I got sidetracked under that. And then what I want to come back to is that even if the congregation dies, and that language maybe isn't the best to use, even if the congregation can no longer afford to subsist by itself as a tax recognized organization with a building at the present time, that doesn't mean that the church died even in that place, right? Now, now we didn't close our church at all this past weekend. We just moved buildings. But it does happen where the same scenario, in fact, we're, we're moving buildings so that we don't have this scenario. The writing was on the wall. The math was done. We were going to have this scenario in a couple of years. And we didn't want it. So we, we made it we made an early decision. If it had been made earlier, ten years earlier, maybe not the same decision would have had to be made. But there were some other things that could have been done. They weren't done. Now let's not go back and play armchair quarterback here, but it does happen that a congregation gets to the point where the church that meets there, which is the believers in Jesus, gathered around the word, no longer by themselves, can afford to maintain a building because buildings are expensive. That just puts them in the exact same place the early church was. The exact same place. Pre-Constantinian. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Hey, look, we don't have a public building. What are we going to do? I guess we will need to get together in a home in someone's garage or basement that's big enough to hold all of us. Does any of us have that? The crazy thing is, though, by the time you get to the point where most congregations, most Most congregations that do find themselves in this situation, by the time they have gotten there, they've already decided the building's more important than the other thing, which they ought to be able to have with them meeting in the basement, which is the pastor, the preacher. Word pastor's fine, although I much prefer the word preacher because it really summarizes far more what the, the duty of the office of the ministry is. Most congregations that end up closing have long ago decided that the building was more important than the preacher. And they do that by insisting to maintain the costs of the building while not calling a preacher. And instead, what they normally will do is try to find some sort of part-time help if they can. Maybe a retired guy. Uh, maybe, Maybe another guy who's further away. And, you know, he'll help out a little bit. Sometimes they form a dual parish. That is two congregations that are eh, approximately near to each other. Two, two, see how I said that though? I even, two buildings that are near to each other with two organizational structures of constitution that then join together financially to pay the pastor's salary. And then he has to kind of do double duty between them. Now, that may indeed be necessary from time to time, but you just got to know it's not a winning strategy for improving your, your growth as a congregation because your pastor's got two minds as a result. He has to. Uh, and fascinating to me, and it, yes, I'm sitting easy where I can say this one right now, but fascinating to me that two congregations that are maybe what, two miles, five miles apart in a city? Because I'm not, country churches, okay, yeah, you're, you're 45 minutes apart. All right, okay. For everyone to drive that far, maybe that's a bit much, but maybe not. We'll come back to that. But, but in, a, in a city where it's like you're five miles apart, why are you not just one congregation? If you have two congregations, two gatherings of people around the word in two buildings that are both very expensive to maintain, so you can't afford a pastor. And so you come together to call a pastor so you can also afford two buildings. And then you're going to make that pastor serve both of you in often idiosyncratic in different ways so that all 15 of you can meet in one building and all 25 of you can meet in another building? 
what are you doing? That's just downright weird. Don't you like singing? Don't you not like don't you like not having the pews be empty? Do you know if you had 15 and 25 together you'd have 40 and the songs would be sung better and the, the pews would be less empty and maybe the kids would have a friend? That kind of thing. It's it's kind of I mean, you sit back, you try to look at this thing objectively, and it's kind of like, what are you doing? Well, the answer is pretty easy. And any pastor is going to tell you, because we, we've been through this enough, we know oh, they're worshiping their building. That's what they're doing. <laughs> that's, just, that's what they're doing. They've decided the building is more important. And so you end up in a situation where eventually a congregation closes, and they, they don't have a pastor either, right? Uh, which uh, congregation closes, where the building has to be closed, and they don't have a pastor either. And so, it, well, even then, though, ah, this is where we, this came from. Even then, the church didn't die. Now, is it true, perhaps, that some individuals there have ceased to place their faith in the Jesus who gives us the true church? That you have to, you know, God has to decide that on a one by one cases on Judgment Day. So, who knows? But is it possible? Of course, it's possible. But assuming the best case scenario, which is that they did all that they could, and that even though they closed the building first or second and got rid of the pastor or didn't call the full-time pastor first, even though that happened, no one knew or understood it, which is probably the case in a lot of cases. They don't have the ecclesiology, like we're talking about, to make the good decision at the time in the crisis. So they, they meant well, and it got to where it is. So all seven people left who can no longer maintain the building, they have to say, we got to close the building and we got to close the organization because there's just nothing else there. Well, assuming they all still believe Jesus has risen from the dead, they are now going to go to another Christian congregation, which preaches that to them. That's what a Christian does. They go hear more. So in that case, the church still did not die because they're the church and they're not dead. They only die when they die. And then again, they're going to rise again. And as a group, they're not alone. And this is, uh, he'll get into this. I'm, let's see how far I've gone off on Constantinianism. Uh, He'll get into this. There's only one church. This is like a, a such an important statement for Christian ecclesiology, right? For for all the buildings and all the denominations and all the people all over the world out there, there's only one true church. And no, it is not the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod because that is a misguided thought. The one true church is not bound to time or space, because the one true church is every single Christian who has ever been a Christian and remains a Christian. We are the church. For that reason, again, the church can never die. The church is, yes, C.F.W. Walther, and yes, Martin Luther, and uh, probably Ulrich Zwingli, <laughs> definitely Calvin, right? Uh, de probably not Pope Leo, but... Uh, the, the one that was so rude, but, but Pope Leo the Great, the, the older one who wrote some good stuff, yeah, probably him. Right? That's the church. Not this organization and not the facility. And so when that little tiny congregation has to shutter its doors once and for all and go find a pastor to preach to them, which is what they need, is the reason they're maybe struggling a little bit, yeah, is because they put their money, their chips, their, their, their future, not on the preaching, but on some other thing. It's not always the case. The demographics is there, you know, all, all that's real too, but often, often the decline is directly related to preaching. Because they put their chips somewhere else other than the preaching, they need the preaching now, right? They're starving, the building's closing. The only hope they have is to go find good preaching again. Now, by good preaching, I do not mean the pastor's personality. Although, a pastor who wants to be a good preacher will learn rhetorical tricks to have personality in the pulpit as part of speaking the language of our culture today, which is entertainment-driven. But by preacher, I don't mean that, right? I mean the guy, because the Bible says guy, who takes the scriptures and then says them out loud again to you as you gather. And helps you to understand them by by reading them together, right? Sola Scriptura, the whole Bible being held together with Scripture interpreting or understanding Scripture. You got to find that, 
or you die. Excuse me. And again, I said a moment ago, or a couple moments ago, uh, that much decline that we see when it does happen to congregations, but not all. So this is not a universal. Much decline that you do see that does happen to congregations is directly related to bad or absent preaching or the people rejecting the preaching, right? And sometimes these go together as well. And so when there's even like a little bit of an absence, the moment that it's possible that the reason we're getting together isn't to listen to that guy who's going to give us some bread and wine too. I mean, you want to add that in there, the, the supper's there, but the reason we're getting together is not to listen to that guy. When that guy's talking, we close our eyes or read the bulletin or uh, color, whatever, but don't listen. Now, I don't, and you can color and listen at the same time. So you're allowed to color, but, but, but if the reason is not to listen to that guy, the moment that happens, the church is on the path to organizationally declining. Yeah. Now, to be fair, you can have a preacher who makes the organization be very successful while giving you lies. Yeah. But, but I mean, get, get follow this, right? Why do people go to Joel Osteen's church? He's a good preacher. Now, I would call him a possibly heretical, definitely unorthodox preacher, but that congregation kind of lives and dies with what he says. It is also the case in a Lutheran church. The, the big distinction is now, Olstein's church is all Olstein's personality, right? A Lutheran church is not that. But this is why preachers must be able to teach, is because at the end of the day, you are going there to listen. And if he, if he can't be listened to, then he's not doing any good, right? So, again, I don't want to emphasize that as much now. That's, that's ministry theology, and I, I want to stay on the ecclesiology, the church side of this, because what, what happens is the moment that the guy can't be listened to for whatever reason, and sometimes individuals just choose not to listen. I mean, that's hardening the heart happens. Then you need another reason to be there besides listening to that guy talk. And you as a group or you as an individual will find it. Usually what will happen is, is you'll have small groups that find it. I don't mean like the ones that meet in houses. I mean, you'll have a little group over here that kind of gathers for this reason. Maybe it's quilting, right? And you have a little group over here that keeps things going for this reason. Well, it's our family's building, church, they say, but they mean building, right? And, and you have like these different groups that kind of will pick this thing or that thing that becomes the new mission, uh, the new purpose of the congregation. Do catch that there's no sin in quilting and there's no sin in having a building, right? The problem is when, with the lack of preaching, those become the things that you decide are the reason you're there. And this is not usually an intellectual decision. This is an emotional decision that just kind of happens, right? Because you don't have the intellect, not mind, but words. You don't have the, the scholarship given to you or equipping you to even realize this is happening to you. Please don't hear that I said intellect meaning you're dumb. That's not what I mean. Uh, you don't have the tools within the intellect being given by the text, right? You don't have the ecclesiology to deal with it and even ask the question, what's our center? What's our purpose? Why are we worshiping the building, everybody, right? You don't have that. And so you will eventually put the hope into some other thing. And then, and now you're in a real predicament, okay? So, I mean, more than ever, because when God looks down from his high heaven, Jesus, our Lord, and he loves you and he wants to save you and he sees that Though you still believe in him, you have also now given your allegiance to what? Uh, the thing that have uh, the luncheons that happen once a year or the, the Christmas pageant, right? I don't care what it is. Right? You've given your allegiance to this thing, whatever it is. Building is just the easy foil to, to the building. Well, since he loves you and wants you to have your trust in him and him alone, he only has one option. Now, did you put the pieces together? Or do I got to do it for you? Since he loves you and wants you to trust in him alone, but you are trusting in this other thing, he must demonstrate to you what a failed God this other thing is. He must show you that the thing made of wood and stone and silver, that it can't speak and it can't hear 
And far from being able to save you, you have to save it. And you even can't do that. He must tear the idol down. So it's not just as though the congregation misplaces itself and the, uh, things run their course or misplaces its trust and things run their course. You actually have Jesus fighting against you at a certain point. Not because he wants to destroy you. He doesn't want to kill a church. He won't kill a church. He can't kill a church. He wants to save you. He wants to remind you that you're part of the church that can't die. And so he's going to take away the thing you put your trust in that's not him so that you're forced to put your trust in him again. That's how the gracious God works. Yeah, It's actually pretty cool of him. Although we who love our idols get frustrated by it, yeah? And I, I, we all have this internally, right? It's not as though we all don't have the, the, the temptation of thinking these things. But the, the issue then becomes, or now is, right? What about when the whole group doesn't just think but says these things and then makes decisions where these things are put into, say, confession effectively, right? That they are who you are as a congregation, as a, as a gathering people. The only hope you have, again, is that the Lord would pull the blanket out from under you while there's still a preacher around. Huh? One way or the other. One guy willing to say, hey, you know, Jesus is sufficient. Huh? Hey, you know, the church is not a building. Hey, you know, the church can't die. Because the church is Jesus, and Jesus is alive. And since you're baptized into Jesus, well, you need a different premise, don't you? So yeah, Christendom, Constantinianism, all sorts of crazy stuff. We didn't even talk about healthcare. Goodness gracious. And life expectation, and, and uh, living standard expectations, all these things. that I'm Not just for pastors, for goodness sakes. More so for Christians. You, you know why you can't afford a pastor? I'm sorry. I'm going to be mean. Unless you really only have three people right? The reason you can't afford a pastor is because you're greedy. That's, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Pastors are expensive. No, don't get me wrong. We're the most expensive piece, which is why people will give us up before they give the building up, which is kind of silly because the building's the second most expensive piece and it's the not necessary one. Yeah. But the fact is that while a pastor is expensive, So's your life. Because your life is expected to be as good as or better than your parents. And you will not settle for less than that financially. And because of that, that's why congregations can't afford pastors. It's not that there aren't pastors who will work for less. There actually are. But it's that you won't live with less at the end of the day. And hey, hey, hey. Pot calling kettle black. I, I am a greedy punk. Honestly, my I cannot let my left hand know that my right hand is writing the check for Sunday, because my left hand will try to stop me. Right? It's just that the flesh within me is wicked on this level. I want a nice life. I like good cheese. Yeah, <laughs> it's expensive, right? Stuff's expensive. I, I I want a nicer car than I have. I won't get one. I don't think ever, probably. But that's okay. It, it doesn't matter what I want, right? What's important is that we would acknowledge that what we want is contrary to what we need and then learn to chase and love what we need and from that position fight against what we want. And so a congregation that has a chance, and again, like I said, if, you have, if there's only three people left, no, you, you can't do this. But if you have 10 families, 10, you can do it. It can be done. It just might mean you don't have everything you want to have that America says you can have. You might have to live with, with less and substantially less. You might have to sacrifice. And truth be told, none of us are really ready for that right now. I'm not ready for it. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm calling us out, right? Not, not you. I'm not ready for it. But as the day continues to come and we see more and more of this, well, got to be ready for it. I don't think I told this story, but I'm going to tell it. It's a little out of school. I'll try not to call anybody out particularly, and this is not local, for those of you who might wonder. I heard recently about a congregation that is in a call-in process for trying to get a pastor, and they're in a, they're in a rather 
pricey area of the country. And what they offered the pastor to to live on was what would be probably, if I take like median income for the area, like a third or a quarter of the median income for a working class professional and no health care, no benefits. And I, I know when I heard the story, I know that when the pastor declines the call, which he's bound to do, right? I know they're going to say, why? <laughs> you know, and it's just like, wait, you all live there. You know what it takes. Why do you think he should have it different? Yeah. Why, why does he have to have a sugar mama do it all for him? Where did that come from? So what this comes back to, the reason I'm harping on this is not because, you know, uh, pastors only think about money, but it is a reality. We've got we've to live. What I'm saying is it really puts us to the test a little bit about where and what we believe in. Because if we're not willing to make sure that we have the best guy we can hear in front of us every week, then we're effectively saying, forget church dying, we're saying we don't really care that much if the congregation lasts. Huh? If you buy a beat up used car that doesn't work right, properly, then you're going to break down by the side of the road. If you hire a part-time pastor whose attentions are divided, well, then that's what you're going to get, right? The church lives from preaching the Word of God. The church lives from what the Scriptures actually say. And that has to be, has to be, where you put your hope. Because that's the thing that tells you the hope is not the preacher himself, but Jesus. See, I'm not preaching preachers here, right? I'm preaching that the words of Jesus must be heard, and that if we don't put our money on that, if we don't make friends by means of earthly wealth for the sake of heavenly things, right, as the Lord says, well, then we only build our own future on the sand. And you know what the text says about that, right? The house, the building, it's going to fall down eventually. All of this out of that one little bit about Constantine, for goodness sakes. I must have been thinking about this stuff for a while. Huh. He, he, Marquardt tells us that it's clear that the, Constantine, the Constantinian era is over, but there's a few doddering state churches sticking around, and, he, and he's right. And it's, it's only going to get worse because many organizations that support churches, right, support congregational groups— and many churches, groups, continue to live kind of on the edge, relying on end-of-life giving to get them over the hump every year. What do I mean by that? If you don't know, hold on, I'm so thirsty. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that a certain generation, often called the greatest generation, and then some of their kids although probably not as much among the boomers, so not amongst the true boomers, although there'll be some there, but not as much, and there'll be less among Gen X, and there'll probably be less among uh, the what are, millennials. Is it Gen X straight into millennial? I think that's right. The greatest generation saved money, often invested well or wisely, if, if not just saved, and when they died, had a plan for that money. And often that plan was to support things that they remember being church for them. Now, this is both good and bad. I mean, it's, it's very pious, I don't, don't get me wrong, and it, it should be done in a sense. Although oftentimes these monies are given not to the needful things, but to the unneedful things that maybe aren't even what you thought they were once upon a time, long ago. Oh, I got a story to tell on that one. Oh, should I say it? Oh, yeah, I'm going to say it. Uh, as an aside, an example, uh, there was a congregation back when I was in Philadelphia that we talked into ceasing to exist as an organization so that with another 
congregation in the area. By means of selling the one building, they could combine and then use the money to call a pastor. And they had enough money that they could probably do it for like eight years. Because the one building was going to sell for quite a bit. And then they did it. And most, if not all of them, never went to the other church. And then the guy who was the chairman at the time, who went to another church immediately and, and said, well, this is always my wife's church. He then only gave the mission about $100,000, which seems like a lot. But if you're going to pay for a pastor, that's, that's a year, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Sem Sem candidate, it's a year. Uh, but pretty quickly, the healthcare stuff goes. I mean, I don't, I don't get paid a hundred thousand dollars, but you add my my health benefits into that, it very easily goes up. Because uh, if you don't know how much your your employer pays for your health benefits, if you got it, it means it's a significant amount of money. So, anyhow, a hundred thousand dollars, and then the other massive chunk of change went to two other organizations, and this was all sort of like blindsiding a little bit here, like like, uh, and one of them is an organization that is worldwide famous within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod for its cutting edge ability to make use of new media tools in order to press the gospel and the words of Jesus out into places that it was was not being done and set the bar really for for a generation of mission work in America that organization is still trying I'm not sure they know what they're doing. That's my opinion, I suppose. I have not worked there. Uh, but it seems like they kind of have the the old trick, and they want the old trick to work. And so, point being, this congregation put all the money there and not at calling a pastor locally, right? And it, to me, that just demonstrates... Uh, the challenge with these kinds of gifts and our hope in the institutions. So again, these institutions that exist, they tend to get more of these gifts than congregations. But in either case, when these gifts are given, now not always, so don't get me wrong. There, there are some that are trying a little better at others than others. When these gifts are given often, they're spent. So, and this is, this is kind of true about boomers inheriting from the greatest generation too. I've seen the statistic at least that most baby boomers are able to spend the inheritance that their parents spent a lifetime saving within three to five years of receiving it, right? And that's sort of happening not just individually to people, which it is, but it's also happening organizationally and institutionally. Now, ideally, you would take those kinds of bits of money and you would create an endowment that would work for you, right? So the money would create money. It actually becomes an employee for you. There's, there's tools for that. And some groups definitely are doing that. Although when things are coming in unrestricted it's, and you got a bill to pay, you know, it, it can be that way. And, and I'd rather not, I'd rather, I'd rather not have to choose the necessary things. Let's, let's pay that bill, right? Rather than let the good thing go. So that situation though, okay, so this is where this all started here. That situation of this income coming in from the greatest generation is five years away from really ending? Ten, maybe? You know, I mean, no one really knows which win pers which person will go, right? And where the the line is between them and the boomers, and uh, who's put money in their in their accounts and whatnot. But without any question, it's going like it's going like this, yeah. And so we still have Constantinian establishment in congregation and institutions that's able to, to kind of pretend, oh, maybe we'll get through this. We'll, we'll just get leaner and meaner. And, but the question is, it was, sure, sure, you should probably do that, but only if you're going to then double down on the thing that's going to work. Now, I'm not talking pragmatics here at all. I'm talking about the things commanded by Jesus, <laughs> uh, the things we're actually sent to do. Because if you don't put the money into the things we're actually sent to do, that means Jesus is going to keep fighting against you. Because he doesn't want the devil's mission to work. And can Christians be involved in the devil's mission? Yes. And still be Christians? Yes. What, you, you never believed a lie? The moment you believe a lie for a moment, you've, you've been a part of the devil's mission. Right? And his mission is to deceive you. <laughs> it doesn't put you out of the kingdom immediately. It, it might eventually. But it doesn't do it immediately. So 
<laughs> this uh, the situation of the giving and the challenges is only going to continue with these establishment churches, groups, congregations, individuals. Now, Marquardt says that the reason this is so hard for us, and this is what I was saying earlier about what we don't want to sacrifice, is that our problem for a long time has been how comfortable we've been. It has been easy. We've had a full coffer. We've been able to do what we want to do. And as a result, it's like government, right? Government says we need a new tax for this thing. But then they do the thing, and then there's still the tax there. They don't take the tax away. They keep it. <laughs> and then they say, well, we better start something with this. With all this money, we better do something with it. And they start a new organization, right? Or a new, a new edge or new this or that. And it just starts to bloat and bloat and bloat and bloat because it never stops. It never stops uh, wanting to be comfortable with itself. But then you run into a situation where it's got so much it can't do it anymore. Mm. Social welfare, education in America and the states. I mean, my state, Illinois, is oof. Oof, that's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. It's just, it's just so bloated. And corruption comes into play. You got all that too. But the, the point is, again, that this is the comfortableness that's at work. And the comfortableness is not there now. And we're striving around trying to grab for the comfortableness. And when we can't find that, we're saying, oh, the church is dying. Because we're not comfortable. And that is a hopeless hopeless thing when the fact is that the church cannot die because the church frankly doesn't care about how comfortable you are i know we put cushions on the pews right now and we took out the kneelers bad idea bad move that one i I know we did that i didn't do it it happened the church doesn't care the real church the body of christ doesn't care about how comfortable you are as you're getting crucified to the world (laughs) the church only cares to remember that this death is the gift of resurrection as well at the same time. And to drive that home, to have that be the the heart of who we are, to have that be what is preached, what is proclaimed, what is heard. And because, now get this, because that is what is preached and is what is heard in the one true church, wherever the one true church is, then the church, wherever it is, can never die. Even though two or three are gathered in his name, they don't die. Should they get, maybe move 20 miles to go to a faithful church? Yeah, they probably should. But they can't die. It's, it's just it's just not possible. Because Jesus is alive. We didn't even talk about ascension. Jeez. So, some concluding matters here. Little little business action. Yeah. Some of what I've said today, inadvertently, is going to be in a book. I, I didn't plan it this way, but uh, it is in a book that should be coming out from CPH in the coming year. I, I should get that date and remember what that date is. Uh, it's called The Word Without Flesh. And the subtitle, if I think, I, we went back and forth on it. It's like, Why Christianity is Dying Even Though Jesus is Alive. Uh, that might not be exactly it, but, uh, so if you like some of this, you think you need some of this, just keep your eye out for that book when it comes out, because I, I do think it is very much what we need. And the book's really about the supper, honestly, but it, it ties to these same kinds of thinking. And then, uh, if you didn't know that I had a second book, I'm finding, I think a lot of people didn't know what happened. Uh, Echo is a book I released just last year. Now, Broken was that old one way back when. A good, good book. Echo's a better book. And interestingly, Echo has not sold well. And I, I don't know why, but I have a hunch. I have a real hunch. And the hunch has something to do with YouTube. Uh, so I'm curious what will happen if I start asking you guys, hey, can you buy some Echo copies? I mean, I get a little money out of this. Not a lot p- per capita, right? But it's kind of it's kind of sad to me that just one year into Echo... The numbers of Echo that sold in the last six months and the numbers of Broken that did, and Broken is really, it still sells, but not a lot. It's, it's really dropped down. The Echo's just like right there with Broken. And I'm just kind of like, whoa. And you know, I, this ain't about, honestly, you can believe what you want. This ain't about me wanting you to buy my book. What is in the book Echo is so important to talking to your neighbors about Christianity for us, 
across cultural barriers, being able to let the jargon go and say what we mean so we can bring them into the jargon, obviously. But echo is, is so imperative for that. I'm really, really surprised. Uh, it just hasn't hmm, got a little more legs. So if you haven't picked it up, think about it because I think it's a good book. Yeah, I don't know. I wrote it, so that's not fair, right? You know, whatever. But so consider looking at Echo. Uh, and then the other thing is always good. You're all, I love the comments as we're going, but also liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting after helps push me up in the logarithm. I did that one on Google, by the way, a couple, a week ago. And I'll just say this briefly here at the end. There was a video on, uh, on, on, on Google a week ago. So if you're, if you're listening to the podcast, you have to go try to find that one. And there's been news recently about Google demonetizing, it's not shutting down yet, but demonetizing certain conservative speakers, which so far as I know, I'm not involved. I'm nowhere near the level where you'd get their attention. It always revolving around Steven Crowder. And okay, so that's like one thing. But what I found really interesting is that in like the next four days, every video that I tried to monetize was demonetized very quickly including the one on infant baptism, which has nothing controversial in it at all. So they're supposed to demonetize when it's a controversial political topic. And really, they're only going to do it when liberals or when, when conservatives are, are talking about it. But so I also did the, the Me Too video, which is a pretty cool thing that we have that in the Bible, honestly. It, not not that, that it happened, but that we have a way to talk about it. Um, that video got demonetized. Now, that one at least is like, okay, rape is a political issue. Sure. But the infant baptism one and the Holy Spirit one, Holy Spirit's not a bird. And that that was weird to me. And, you know, demonetize. So far, in two weeks of YouTube, yeah, uh, doing this regularly, I think I made 20 bucks. Whoo, wow, I'm going to break the bank, yeah? It's not like it's really a thing, but what is a thing to me is why they're demonetizing videos about baptism with no other content in it besides me talking, right? And what influence that might have on when they decide to start shutting down any type of what they would call uh, alt-right talk, which does include Christianity. So I find that interesting. With that, I've said this before, if you if you aren't subscribed to my newsletter, then you should probably do that. I've not sent one now yet. I mean, there was the one I did years ago. It'll be the same mailing list, but I haven't sent one. So if you sign up, you're not going to get one, <laughs> at least for a little while. Uh, it's too much work. But but in the event that the channel goes down, you might want to be able to have me shoot you an email and be like, hey, the videos are over there now, that kind of thing. So meanwhile, like, subscribe, share, leave a comment. That helps push it up so other people find it. We can find more of those guys like the atheist that was yelling at me yesterday or the, the lady who's concerned about the occult stuff on my t-shirts and all that. Like, that's always fun to talk about. And of course, we want people not to just talk about it. We want them to hear the law and gospel of Jesus and, and be converted to it. Yeah. So you haven't read either yet, Jordan. What are you? What? But our friends said Broken was dense. What? You can't read a book about Star Wars? Are you kidding me? Man. Well, honestly, yes, Broken was dense. Uh, it, I think it's still pretty readable, and but it's 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 repetitive. Like I have a, it's just a problem I have as a writer and I wasn't really aware of it at that point. So I didn't take a lot out of it. It's repetitive, and uh, so it's too long as a result. So it is it's thick read, but it's also dense. It's also just challenging. It like makes you think. It's like, hey, do you know, you might be thinking about things that are dangerous to your soul. And you're like, but I've always done that. That's hard to think about, right? And so, yeah, right. So there's that. But uh, Echo, I don't know if I'd call Echo dense. I don't think I would. Maybe I, maybe I would. I think it's deep. But I would agree with the statement that, that Broken's dense. Echo different thing, different thing. All right, cool. So uh, I'm going to go and this video again will disappear because it's the podcast this week and it will appear again after the podcast is out. But because there are those who subscribe to the podcast and because there are those who support me financially by means of the podcast, I'm not going to leave it out there. I'm going to let them see it first. Oh yeah. So if you do want to support me, it all is done through Patreon. They take a little 2% cut of the whole thing, and they too could cut the spout off at some point if they wanted to. Also, an organization that has done that to people in the past. That being said, uh, it functions very easily, very well, and you're effectively charged per podcast. So four times a month, if you sign up, 
whatever number you put, just know that's coming out four times a month. And that goes to help make all this possible. As I leave behind KFUO, by the way, um, that's more necessary than ever. So I'm, I'm losing, I'm losing a little ground here. I got to try to make it up. So if you like what I'm doing on YouTube, support the podcast, you know, even if you don't listen to the podcast, but you should listen to the podcast because I think it's got some, uh, well, it's got a, a different take on things too. So, all right. Thank you guys. I will be back tomorrow. Probably. Um, yeah, no. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Rock on. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? Click the Patreon link in the show notes to sign up. Pretty please? <laughs>